Hello, welcome to the League of Women Voters of Portland's Voter Forum for the November 3, 2020 election on ballot measure 26218, which the voters pamphlet describes in its question as, should Metro fund roads, transit, safety improvements, bridge repair, and transportation programs by establishing a tax on certain employers, 0.75% of payroll? I'm Chris Kobe, the forum moderator for the League of Women Voters. The League is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to making democracy work. We believe democracy works best when voters are informed about issues and engaged in their communities. We are presenting this forum to give Portland voters the opportunity to learn more about this ballot measure. Speaking for the measure is Alejandro Gallegos Chacon, Youth Community Organizer for Opal Environmental Justice in Portland. Speaking against the measure is Jill Island, member Stop the Metro Wage Tax campaign team. Because of the COVID-19 pandemic, we cannot now hold in-person measure events. Therefore, the two sp spokespersons and I are participating from our own locations. We are grateful for the support of Carol and Velma Sailing Foundation, the League of Women Voters of Portland Education Fund, the Weiss Foundation, the Sarah Fruing Fund, and our media partner, Community, I'm sorry, Metro East Community Media. And now for the forum rules. The spokespersons may each give a two minute opening statement. They will then both have 90 seconds to answer questions we have prepared and provided to them in advance. Each advocate will have the opportunity for a two minute closing. We will alternate the order in which the spokespersons answer questions. I ask the spokespersons please to adhere to the allotted time limits. As determined by a coin toss, Ms. Island will give the first opening statement. Ms. Island, please proceed. Hello, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak to your constituents and to provide some additional information that hopefully all Oregonians will consider as they cast their mail-in ballots. I am Jill Island, as Chris introduced me. I'm a native Oregonian, and I've turned my 40 years of advocacy experience to the Stop the Metro Wage Tax campaign because I believe so firmly that this is the wrong tax at the wrong time against the backdrop of an historic pandemic and an economic recession, Metro has plowed ahead to propose a wage tax on working families at a time when they're already being crippled by the impacts of the pandemic. I was part of the conversation from the business community side that put the transportation package together over the course of nearly two years. And I would tell you that we're not taking issue with many of the component parts of the transportation package itself. The business community opposition that is unanimously represented on our website came together because of the funding mechanism that was selected and the fact that the business community was not allowed to participate in designing that funding mechanism in a way that would support family paychecks going forward. So we know that since the pandemic began that nearly 120,000 Oregonians in Multnomah, Clackamas and Washington County have been impacted by the pandemic. And nearly 300,000 Oregonians statewide have lost their jobs as a result. Uh, the uh, wrong tax at the wrong time comes because payroll taxes hurt the people whose paychecks can least afford to absorb that extra cost. Even though Metro tried to call this a tax on business, this is in fact a tax on wages of family paychecks. And that's why we're so opposed. It impacts about 515,000 private sector employees and 70,000 nonprofit organization jobs. And at the very last minute, Metro exempted itself and other local and state government agencies from paying the new permanent tax. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Ella, uh, Ms. Gallegos Chacon, it is now your opportunity. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, good morning, uh, folks, and to the League of Women Voters. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, but also, I'm incredibly grateful to have this PDX chapter um, 
thriving, quite frankly, in, in the fact that you all have the foresight uh, some years ago to make sure we had a voting constituency that is invested in climate and in equity and in voter advocacy and education from a nonpartisan stance. So I'm extremely grateful to be here with you all today and for paving the road for young women like myself to be here as well. Um, my name is Alejandra Gallegos. Um, I grew up in Hillsboro, Oregon, and I now live in Northeast Portland. And what I can tell you on why people like myself and my communities are really excited for a measure as robust and progressive and as bold as this one is because, you know, I, I grew up uh, near TV Highway. I went to Glencoe um, High School and had family in the century area. And if you're familiar with TV Highway, it's quite frankly, it's a death trap. <laughs> um, there is really cool things to do like the bowling alley and movie theaters, but I was not allowed to uh, walk there because it was such a fender bender area. Um, there's, you know, the occasional crime and it just was a really unsafe um, walking area. So my parents were definitely, um, you know, they were working, they were busy, they did, couldn't necessarily always take us. So I spent a lot of my childhood indoors. Um, and that's something that all youth should have access to. And now living, thank you, in Northeast Portland in the land of no sidewalks, um, there's just a really big equity discrepancy. And this measure is actually gonna be working to invest in communities that have been long overdue and neglected, like communities, the ones that I grew up in. So I hope you all vote yes on this measure and um, I'm excited to talk more about it today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gallegos. We'll now move to the questions part of the forum. Question one, we'll go to Ms. To Ms. Gallegos. Is there a need for a solution to the problem this measure seeks to address? Why or why not? Yes, um, like I mentioned, uh, 16 of these major corridors that we'll be investing in are in BIPOC, which means Black and Indigenous and POC neighborhoods and working class neighborhoods. So we're talking about 82nd, Powell, 122nd, TV Highway, 185th, you know, big main streets that everyday people use like you and myself. And we need them to be safe. We need them to be reliable. Um, and this really seeks to make transit and biking and walking a safer alternative for people um, that are driving. But we also are investing in roadways to improve your daily commute to work. So without this measure, I foresee a lot of these cracked roads, these old bridges, these highly unsafe areas will continue to be uh, forgotten. And I honestly don't know when we would get to address them. And I can surely tell you that in two years, it'll be too late. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Island, your response, is there a need for a solution to the problem that this measure seeks to address? Why or why not? Oregonians who've been asked what their priorities are these days certainly first list the economic recovery that will come post-COVID. But I think the solution to the, to the situation here is a continued community conversation that should be delayed because the world changed significantly once the COVID-19 virus was identified and began to spread around the globe when Metro had this two-year conversation with the community about what the component parts of this package should be, the pandemic had not been foreseen. It has changed everything. And I believe, we believe that we need to slow down, come back to the table in a post-COVID environment, identify a funding mechanism that the business community can get behind because business is a very big stakeholder in transportation investments. I agree that safety measures and other investments need to be made along TV Highway, 82nd, and other arterials. But I want your viewers to remember that ODOT has built and maintained and managed those corridors. And just because they have short funded them doesn't mean that metro area taxpayers should pay the entire freight. Thank you. Question two. One of the arguments in favor of this measure states that this measure will create more than 37,500 family wage jobs. If jobs would be created by this proposal, how many jobs do you estimate would be created? What kind of jobs would these be? And how do you define jobs in your answer? For example, 
one job for multiple years by position created, or the same job once each year the job exists. We'll start with you, Ms. Island. The Stop the Metro Wage Tax Campaign believes that the jobs predictions that the proponents of this measure have put forth are exaggerated and are calculated in a way that would suggest there are going to be more temporary jobs at the expense of permanent jobs, I would note, than can possibly be created. By a two-page analysis done by local economics impact firm at Eco Northwest, um, even they had to back down from the two-page analysis they provided to the Metro Council because the jobs that are being touted in media outlets and other places suggest that the, there are 37,500 jobs, when in fact, that's not the annual average. That is jobs in total over several years of the project. And I would note that those are many temporary jobs coming from out of state, and they're going to be created at the expense of working family paychecks and working families right here in Oregon. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gallegos Chacon, over to you. The arguments, one of the arguments in favor of this measure states that it will create more than 37,500 family wage jobs. If jobs would be created by this proposal, how many jobs do you estimate would be created? What kind of jobs would these be? And how do you define jobs? One job for multiple years by position created? or the same job once each year the job exists. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, you know, I think this is where we'll respectfully disagree, Miss Island. Um, if you ask any construction worker, if you work any working class family that works a blue collar job, they will tell you that jobs in construction are meaningful careers. These are family wage earned, uh, I'm sorry, pays, and these are also um, union protected jobs. And a time like this that you are also encouraging is hard on families. We need jobs at this moment. Um, and these are jobs that Metro has committed to going to small businesses that are women owned and other marginalized identities owned at home in Oregon. So, you know, frankly, holding off these jobs right now in an economic recession that is by far the most unequal we have seen, um, we need these jobs right now. And yes, they are going to be over the long span of some years because it takes it takes time to rebuild roads. It takes time to remodel a bus line. It takes time to add over 400 miles of protected bike lanes. So it's interesting to hear that, you know, jobs aren't the right moment when we're in an economic recession. And may I remind you, we did have business partners at the task force level who were very on board with this measure until it came down to the funding mechanism not being on the people. Thank you. Question three. The largest single corridor project identified in the proposal is the 975 million Southwest Corridor Max Line between Portland and Bridgeport Village in Washington County. Based on what facts and assumptions did this project become the largest single project by cost by far in the proposal? We'll start with uh, Ms. Gallegos Tacon. Yeah. So two years ago when we started working on this measure, the Southwest project was one of the only projects Metro was seeking to invest. And then community partners like myself, Opal, ARP, Verde, and countless other organizations came together and said, you know what, no, it cannot just be this rail that goes to a mall. It needs to be 82nd. It needs to be neighborhoods that are historically black, that are historically working class, and that are historically immigrant and refugee communities. And we had to push so hard, I won't lie to you, on Metro to really listen and consider, but they were able to reach across through community and business members and come together to say, you know what, we're going to make a progressive investment to build the communities we like to see. So what if the federal level is a hot mess right now? We need to be building the U.S. that we want to see right here at home in the Metro region. Thank you. Um to you, Ms. Island, uh, the largest single corridor project identified in the proposal is the 975 million Southwest Corridor Max Line between Portland and Bridgeport Village in Washington County. Uh, based on what facts and assumptions did this project become the largest single project by cost by far in the proposal? Well, we've just heard why the project was 
uh, included. It is the lion's share of the money. The Southwest Corridor Project is about 35% of the revenue, I believe. And the dissonance here is that Metro has wrapped this in an equity argument. And I would like to understand how anybody believes that tearing up 150 businesses, displacing 300 houses from Southwest Portland to a high-end mall in Bridgeport can be construed as an equity investment. Um, and additionally, we've learned that TriMet is having a lot of fiscal challenges as a result of a decline in ridership due to the pandemic. And in fact, while the light rail may get built with some help from federal funding should this measure pass, there may not be money for any additional operating costs. So we'd have the light rail, but we couldn't hire the bus drivers and we couldn't hire the max drivers to operate the actual system. This has a negative impact on working people. And you can call it a business tax, but it's a wage tax. And when given the opportunity with the Portland Business Alliance and Metro to focus on the business community funding, the equity portions of the measure, that option, that offer was dismissed immediately. Thank you. Next question. One of the arguments in favor of this measure states that 60% of these investments will serve lower income communities of color and other areas that have historically been ignored or harmed by transportation planning and spending. Do you agree with that statistic? And do you know how that figure was calculated? We'll start with Ms. Ireland. I don't know how that figure is calculated. I've heard it talked about, and I think it may be because many of the people who are most severely impacted by the pandemic and shrinking paychecks are the same people who are along some of these corridors where investments are going to be made. We don't believe there is anything equitable about shrinking family paychecks. So do we agree that some investments need to be made in some of those corridors mentioned? Yes. Should ODOT be managing and investing in and repairing the corridors they've already developed? Yes. Should these taxes be leveled only at metro area voters? No. So again, to wrap this in an equity argument when there's nothing equitable about taking away permanent jobs for some rather inflated estimates on what the temporary out-of-state jobs are going to create is a, a false choice for Oregonians. We need to get together and set the priorities for the region. We need to find the right funding mechanism in a post-COVID environment and we do all need to work together to make that happen. Metro spent two years on the community conversation to create the package, two months to talk about the funding mechanism, and two minutes to exempt themselves from paying the tax. Ms. Gayagos Chacon, over to you. One of the arguments in favor of this measure states that 60% of these investments will serve lower income, communities of color, and other areas that have historically been ignored or harmed by transportation planning and spending. Do you agree with that statistic? And do you know how that figure was calculated? Yes, thank you. Um, and I know, you know, the women of, the League of Women Voters are smart and educated, and I encourage you all to do your own research and I can follow up with the equity and environmental impacts of the package that Metro produced um, that I actually took a big part on as one of the community leaders. And as a woman of color myself, um, who is from Oregon and has grown up in a working class family and knows the areas that we'll be investing in very well, I can tell you that it is time and long overdue for government and Oregon to invest in its communities of color and working class people. Um, this measure particularly looked at making commutes safer and faster and more reliable for working class areas, so low income homes. And we also looked at neighborhoods that were historically communities of color. So I think at any moment, it's easy for um, folks like Miss Island who have the privilege to wait and have the privilege to advocate for themselves um, and the privilege to probably get around however you feel is most feasible. Um, but for working class people who depend on transit and who depend on walking and biking um, and even folks who are driving for multifamily homes, it is not safe and we cannot wait any longer. So. I'm happy to share with you all the equity and environmental impact uh, uh, analysis that was done so that the women can decide for themselves because I know you all are educated and don't necessarily just feed off of what uh, Miss Island is saying. So thank you. 
Last question. Uh, this one will go to Ms. Gallegos Tricon. Please provide more specifics on how the projects in this measure will improve safety for pedestrians and bicycles. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So some of the things that I'm really excited about, especially as a queer woman, um, is streetlights. Portland is one of the darkest cities in the nation. And I imagine that some of you all like are scared to walk in certain parts of the area at night because it's not well lit. So we'll be adding over 500 new street lights. Um, we're gonna be adding over 400 miles of protected bike lanes. Um, so those are bike lanes that have the barrier from cars because there's so many fatalities each year, even when there is bike lanes. Um, and then the other thing that I'm personally most excited about is Youth Pass. Youth Pass is gonna make it free for um, all high school age youth to ride free for transit, removing that barrier to get to school, removing that barrier of being able to participate in economic and extracurricular activities and get to medical appointments. So having a safe and reliable way to know that you're going to get to and from school, to and from your doctor's appointment is super important for these families and for youth of color to be more independent and have opportunities of those of their peers. So overall, I think this is a really incredible package and and it really is going to be safer for folks with disabilities, for working class folks, and the older community in which you need to be able to age out safely in your neighborhood. Ms. Island, please provide more specifics on how the projects in this measure will improve safety for pedestrians and bicyclists. The business community would acknowledge that safety investments are going to be an important step to take and but probably not at the expense of a 5.2 billion dollar permanent new tax. Voters should know that in the last two election cycles alone, Metro has levied 3.6 billion dollars in additional taxes to pay for parks, affordable housing, and homeless services. This is the largest proposed regional tax measure in Oregon's history and if it was just about safety or just about equity, it would not include a light rail line, the lion's share of the cost of this measure uh, to Bridgeport, a high-end mall. And to clarify, I grew up in East Multnomah County. I went to David Douglas High School. I came from a working class family as well. And I understand the corridors that are being invested in. So I wish that we could have a more civilized conversation and collaborate together to identify the region's priority with some genuine leadership, both from government and from business, as we identify a funding mechanism that will not cripple working family paychecks. Thank you both for responding to these questions. It is now time for summing up and closing remarks. You will each have two minutes. Ms. Island, you may begin. Thank you. Well, I know that this, this is a contentious election season. I'm sorry that we're all spending time, energy, and limited resources on fighting one another rather than coming together. Because transportation, as I mentioned previously, is a very significant investment that the business community wants and needs, not only to move its employees to and from work in the best and most efficient ways possible, but to move the goods and services that are manufactured right here in Oregon. I would tell you that a payroll tax though is the wrong way to do it. Even Metro Councilor Bob Stacy, and I'm looking up because I wanna read his quote directly, in February of this year said, the payroll tax is a shameful way of imposing the cost of the needed service on the working people in our region and letting the wealthy off the hook. This is not a tax on wealth or on uh, high wage individuals. This is a tax on working family paychecks. And Craig Dirksen in July of 2020 said for him, what funding source we use is less important because in the end, there's only one source of money. It's coming out of taxpayers' pockets. So I think that a $5.2 billion new permanent tax actually provides an ongoing funding source for Metro. In fact, they're having to borrow money to implement the homeless services measure and the uh, affordable housing measure because it takes a lot of money to collect a lot of new tax revenue. This is an historic tax that's coming at an unprecedented time in an economic downturn in the region and in the world. We urge your no vote. We would like business, uh, we would commit to business coming back to the table. 
once this measure is defeated so that we can have a more comprehensive conversation about the safety investments and tran uh, transportation investments that are required to move people and freight. This is not the measure. This is the wrong tax at the wrong time. Thank you. Ms. gallegos Chacon. it is your turn to close. Yes, thank you. Um, and you know, Ms. Island, I wish we could have an honest conversation. Um, uh, I want to reference that uh, for folks who are still curious, the employer tax will only impact 9% of businesses. 70% of workers. Excuse me. 70% of workers. Excuse me. Has, excuse me. It just has to be an uninterrupted two minutes. Please go ahead, Ms. gallegos Chacon. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. um, only 9% of businesses will be taxed. Nike just had one of the best annual quarterly reports in decades. And those are the businesses that will be taxed. Businesses that can afford to invest in our community. So 91% of families and your favorite mom and pop shop will not be taxed in this. I think we really need to come together as a community, as people who are in business who can afford to invest in the future we decide to create. I cannot wait to see um, more fires in my community due to climate change. And that will be the new normal if we don't act now. And this is the only ballot on, in November that will actually be addressing climate change and huge racist inequities in our community. So I will be sure to follow up with the environmental and equity impact analysis Metro did, but thank you so much again for your time today. And I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen to an actual woman of color. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Island and Ms. Gallegos Chacon for your participation in this voter forum. Audience members, please share this forum recording with your family and friends. We all need to be informed voters in this election. This recording and other information about this and other ballot measures and the candidates are available now on vote411.org through election day. Ballots are mailed to all registered voters on October 14. As with all Oregon elections, this is mail-in. Ballots are due by 8 p.m. on Tuesday, November 3. Postmarks do not count. Mail your ballot, no postage required, by Tuesday, October 27 to ensure it is received by election day. After October 27, find a drop-off location near you by checking www.vote411.org or your voters pamphlet. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit membership organization. We hope that this forum was meaningful to you. We welcome you to join or contribute to lwvpdx.org. This is Chris Kobe for the League of Women Voters of Portland. Thank you for watching. Please be an informed voter and remember, your vote counts.